talk a bit about Donald Trump. I'm also probably going to talk a little bit about that story that you just heard in our news bulletin regarding musicians and, and touring in Europe. I, 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 I do know what I want to talk about regarding Donald Trump. I, I don't know that today is the day for calling out the hypocrisy and the dishonesty of people who either applauded or um, allowed or uh, even perhaps ignored. Would those be the three three verbs to describe the unforgivable response to Donald Trump's depravity. Uh, it, uh, some people applauded, so you'd file your farage under that, I suppose. Um, some people ignored. I don't, I don't know where that sits morally. Is it, is it worse than applauding something? I mean, the, you know the old adage about all that it takes for evil to, to triumph is for good men to do nothing. So if you were a good man and you ignored it, then I guess you've got some questions to answer. If you were a nasty piece of work, the chances are you were too busy applauding to ever be accused of ignoring. So you've got the applauded, you've got the ignored, and then you've got the... What's the other one? Allowed? Just sort of sat back, not not quite ignoring it, but... No, waving it through on, on the sort of grounds of, oh, no, you have to respect the office, not the man. Or waving it through on the grounds that, well, you know, I quite like how vile he's being to the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, so, so he can't be all bad. Or, or, or is that applauding? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, today's not the day for that. What I would like you to do today is the um, simple question. Well, two things, really. There's an overarching question here which is one that, believe it or not, I asked Roger Stone, did Roger Stone get a pardon? I haven't been able to keep up. I know Steve Bannon did. Here's an interesting legal question that kind of sums up Donald Trump's presidency in a sentence or three. So Steve Bannon was accused of stealing money from people who had contributed to build the wall. So Steve Bannon was accused of stealing money from Donald Trump supporters who had contributed money to build the wall that Donald Trump had promised that Mexico would pay for. He pleaded not guilty, but you can't be pardoned from something you haven't done. So legally, does Steve Bannon accepting a pardon or a commutation or whatever it's called, does that nullify his not guilty plea? The, the point is, think of that. So well, Donald Trump's key consigliere in the early days stands accused of defrauding Donald Trump supporters who sent in money to pay for the wall that Donald Trump was elected on a promise to make Mexico pay for. Try and unravel that. You can't. Because, of course, complete corruption, whether, whether moral or legal, does not allow rational analysis. And, and so, you know, we are where we are. So, overarching question, one which I did ask Roger Stone many, many, many moons ago. Does he know he's lying? I still, I still don't have an answer to that question. I'm still 52-48 on it, to use the ratio of our, of our age. I still don't know. Does he know he's lying? So, you know, obviously the best example, latterly, is the ludicrous claims about the election being stolen from him. That's why he can't go to the inauguration. It's no more complicated than that. He has to avoid the inauguration to keep the following aflame, right? If he goes to the inauguration, it's it's the ultimate, if you like, endorsement of normality. So he can't go to the inauguration because he has to keep the flames of his latest lies, arguably his biggest lie of all, he has to keep it burning. But when you watch him, I don't think I've ever known anyone like this, or if I have, they've hidden it better than he does. The, 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 the idea that you get to choose what you believe. You know, imagine if you walked outside now and you didn't like the weather, so you just described completely different meteorological conditions. Oh, blimey, of course he did that, didn't he, on the day of his own inauguration. <laughs> so it's possibly, I don't know whether that makes it a brilliant example or a bad one. But imagine you now walked outside. Imagine if you were with someone. This is the most fascinating thing about Donald Trump. And I have to tell you that my enthusiasm for discussing it is increasing with every passing minute. Because he doesn't, of course, have the nuclear codes or imminently he won't be in charge of anything except, I mean, his own imminent bankruptcy and possible arrest. So... You walk outside with Donald Trump, right? 
and maybe like Theresa May, you let him hold your hand. You, you walk outside with Donald Trump and it's raining. And Donald Trump turns to you and he says, oh man, I love this sunny weather. Now, there are two questions there psychologically. There's a question about the man who said, oh man, I love this sunny weather when you're all close to drowning in monsoon conditions. And then number two, how desperate to believe that it's not raining do you have to be to go along with a bloke who's claiming that it's sunny when you are absolutely drenched? And that is the question that still intrigues me the most. I can only apologise if it doesn't... Um, I think Stone got his pardon last year, actually, didn't he? I, 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 I can only apologise if it doesn't intrigue you as much as it intrigues me, but goodness knows, I spend 364 days a year doing your bidding, so today I think you can do mine. And, and that, that question is absolutely fascinating to me. Now, we won't be able to get a definitive answer. There'll be no Mystery Hour star rounds of applause today because we can't see inside his mind. I don't know. I still don't know. When he went to bed last night, is he, in his heart of hearts, does he honestly think that his votes have been stolen? And when he's phoning up, the was it the governor of Georgia? essentially encouraging him to, to break the law and lie on his behalf. But if you listen to the tape, it's as if he does actually believe that if the governor, I think it was Georgia, if I could be wrong, it has been known, although I don't think in the context of Donald Trump. But anyway, it, 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 it was as if he actually thought maybe if the, uh, if the governor of Georgia were to have a look behind the sofa, could you just have, there might be a few million votes there, there might be a few thousand votes there. It was as if he thought, you know, if you just move the yoghurt in the fridge, you might find a few thousand votes behind the... Yoga. You listen to the, to the recordings that were leaked and you find yourself wondering genuinely whether or not he believes the absolute and abject nonsense that comes out of his mouth, which is why we've got two problems this morning, or two questions this morning. One is, do, do you think he believes it? 0345 And the other one, I mean, really, apart from the racism, what other reason was there to go along with the lies? I, I know it's simplistic and crass, but I do think possibly we spent way too long over the course of the last four years, I mean, the responsible members of the media, trying to uh, portray him with at least a veneer of credibility and plausibility. If you, if you look at what, what I suppose could be loosely described as liberal media or, um, or honest, honest media, I suppose, then... They were desperate at every turn to, to say, oh, this is the moment he became presidential. Do you remember? Now, I can tell you why that was, weird though it may seem to you. Why would honest journalists, as opposed to, you know, the, the, the people pronouncing on Fox News or some of the far-right websites that people like Steve Bannon um, heralded into the mainstream, uh, I think one of the most toxic of those websites employs someone who's also on the staff of Andrew Neil's Spectator. So this stuff is, is you know, this stuff is has already infected the main, mainstream, if not on the staff, then certainly on the payroll. So you, you, you look at honest journalists, flawed but decent men and women, trying to make sense of this, and because Trump's depravity was so complete and so obvious, they ended up almost praying that he wouldn't turn out to be as bad as they kind of knew he would be. Which is why every time he read out somebody else's words from his auto queue, or every time his Twitter account got confiscated by one of his aides, and he posted something that wasn't pants down misogynistic, or wasn't absolutely stone cold racist, or wasn't uh, completely disgusting, or, or Islamophobic, or whatever the bigotry was that particular day, whenever he did something that didn't immediately display his own moral depravity, people from CNN and the Washington Post and the New York Times were queuing up to say, this is the moment that Donald Trump became presidential. And you sort of sat there going, this is the problem, of course, with not having uh, footballification tendencies. So the problem with having an open mind is that you actually wanted it to be true. Even if you found Donald Trump disgusting on every imaginable level, 
I mean, there's, there's a reason why redemption is a huge part of the Christian message. You kind of wanted him to be redeemed or to redeem himself, because the alternative, of course, is to conclude that 70 million Americans actively love the depravity. They love the immorality. They love the misogyny. They love the racism. They love the abuse of war heroes, the abuse of disabled people, the um, boasting about sexually assaulting women. That, that's the really grim alternative that people like me cannot ever, I don't think, fully understand. 70 million people either loved it or considered it worth excusing in return for being allowed to be racist again. I think we've overcomplicated it, haven't we? There, there, there is very little more to it than that from where I'm sitting. I could, of course, be wrong. But Donald Trump is an incredibly egregious liar. He lies in a way that Normally, you grow out of at the age of about eight or nine, you know, the, the big boy did it and ran away school of lying. The I've got a girlfriend, but she went to a different school um, world of lying. That, that level of lying that's almost prepubescent and for reasons that biographers will no doubt wrestle with in the coming years, he never grew out of it. It never got knocked or, or, or educated out of him. So this mother of all liars, this, this, this lodestar of liar, this death star of deceit, still punting his calumnies, still publicly pronouncing things that are demonstrably and completely untrue, and hand-wringing, muesli-munching liberals like me sit here going, I mean, what do people get in return? Because we can't quite believe that the invitation to be publicly racist, again, is so intoxicating. It seems so wrong and so weird to us to be told, yeah, don't worry about all the people that died on the Capitol. You're allowed to be racist again now. Don't worry about the absolute uh, carnage that Donald Trump's coronavirus policies have inflicted upon his own people. You're allowed to be racist in public again. He even banned Muslims, man. He's my dude. There's nothing else, is there? That's all it ever was. That's all the offer ever was. Just line up all the people in this country that have cheered, cheered for him. And, and what have they all got in common? Yeah, funny that. So, hit the numbers now and start with this one, okay? 0345 6060973. Oh, oh, Donald Trump will be Britain's biggest ally after Brexit, said Jacob Rees-Mogg, of course. Um, line them all up, every single one of them. Give me a call and tell me whether you think with, with I don't know, with psychological qualifications or absolutely no skin in the game whatsoever, do you think that Donald Trump believes his own lies? Because if you look at Nazi propagandists and, and some of the claims and comments that came out during the Nuremberg trials, they... They loved it. They loved lying. And, and they understood the psychology of lying. And they talked about a lie being halfway around the world before the truth has got his trousers on. And, and it's, it's all there. And the, the rhetoric of how you persuade a population to uh, demonize and scapegoat minorities in order to keep the people in power off the hook. It's all there. And they understood it. They wrote the flipping playbook. If you made me put my mortgage on one side of this question, I think right now I'd say that in many ways the most credulous believer of Donald Trump's lies was Donald Trump. To be completely clear, this is, I don't think this is a question that, that admits a, a, a proper answer. I don't think we will ever know. My feeling is uh, he, he believes his own lies, and I don't understand that. I don't have the psychological training. A lot of people use phrases like narcissistic personality disorder. It may well be the case, but I'm certainly not qualified to comment, and I'm, I'm not that keen to let anybody else similarly unqualified to arrive at similar conclusions. But hey-ho, maybe we'll have no choice, because we're asking I'm really the defining question of the um, second half of the second decade of the 21st century. Did Donald Trump actually believe the lies that he told? And the people who went along with it, because he allowed them to be publicly racist again, and don't make any mistakes, 70 million Americans were, were still up for it. Personally, I think he would have won if it wasn't for the coronavirus, the death toll of which in America has just crashed through the 400,000 mark. <laughs> I love that idea that oh, we didn't start any foreign wars. Mate, he, he's responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Americans. They didn't need a foreign war. Imagine if 400,000 Americans had been killed by bomb attacks from... Uh, enemies of America. Oh, he's a very peaceful president. 400,000 Americans. I, I don't know which measure you would use to, to work out how many of those deaths could have been avoided if he knew 
what day of the week it was in the context of coronavirus. But, um, I mean, carry on, please, because we all need a giggle. But, you know, oh, he's a very peaceful president. What was the death toll again? 400,000. And, and what was his advice? Drink bleach. Okay, yeah, very peaceful, very peaceful president. And locking kids in cages? Well, at least he, um, at least it was on American soil, not, not Syrian So Right, okay, yeah. Did he make the trains run on time? Don't be ridiculous, he's not Mussolini. Alex in Cardiff. Alex, what do you reckon? Hi, James, how's it going? You okay? Um, why, are you worried about me? Oh, no, just being polite, <laughs> I guess. No, I am, I'm fine, thank you. What do you want to say? Um, I'm just obviously talking about Donald Trump. I mean, first and foremost, I'm just, I'm just so relieved that he didn't win the next term, because he didn't like to validate the way he's operated for the past four years, because if he'd won the second term, he'd, well, they've got two terms, got two terms, so the humiliation is fantastic. But specifically on your point, I just think that... Um, I don't genuinely think he knows that he's lying. I just think he's just got no ability to perceive, to see how his behaviour has been perceived by other people. And I think like, a good example from the start of his presidency was back in uh, uh, at the uh, port of Puerto Rico when yes. he went over there to, um, and he appeared not to realise that Puerto Rico was part of America. Yes. But, but that's ignorance. Finally... That's ignorance, not dishonesty, isn't it? And then, yes, and then uh, the, the, the ignorance comes galloping along behind the dis dishonesty because he can't admit that he was ignorant. So, I mean, they're intrinsically linked, but they are distinct. Yes, but then when he when he went to visit them, and then he was he was uh, meeting people in the crowd, and he was ch and he started chucking all the toilet tissues into into the crowd. I think yes. that was a moment for me, and I was just like, wow, he really thinks that this is how he should be perceived and how people will support him publicly and then all, all of the other disgusting things he's done for us. Now, it's well. interesting that you pick upon that moment. I may have to uh, summon my quill and parchment, Keith, if you, if you could find me a quill and parchment. I may start making a list of the moments that you think best distill the depravity. I appreciate you haven't rung in to, to do that specifically, but... Um, yeah. But that, for that me, moment. wouldn't be in the top ten, the Puerto Rico moment. But now that you mention it, it is quite emblematic, isn't it? Yeah, and it wasn't. It wasn't. And it wasn't. It wasn't the whole lying thing. It was the way that he felt. Because for me, going through, I think is this guy for real or not? Is this actually actually really happening? So, if you start uh, from a starting point of um, a, 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 of complete, I, I, like detached from the truth, yeah. then factor in. He genuinely believes whatever he wants to believe. And then, and this is the crucial point, absolute contempt for the general public, absolute contempt for pretty much everybody, actually. And that's, that's how. And so he stands there thinking, these idiots are cheering because I'm throwing them tissues. Yeah. But they're cheering, so I must be... The dom, but maybe as more it were. than that. Maybe more than that. Thinking he, from from the media's perspective, he 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 thinks this is what people do. They go and be heroes. They they offer aid. They offer help. And there he is, chucking tissues in like a really, really strange, curious way. Remember, they was throwing it into the crowd, and most of them were journalists. It was just like something watching and thinking, "Wow, what is this guy?" Uh, what an what interesting moment to pick. I, I, I mean, it, it's it's constitutionally curious, Puerto Rico. Um, it's sort of technically part of America, but not at the same time. I don't think you get to vote, which if you if you are a Puerto Rican who lives in Puerto Rico, you don't have a vote for the US president. And yet, I think last year he stood up and said, I'm not going to say the best, but I'm just about the best thing that ever happened to Puerto Rico. You better vote for me, Puerto Rico. Yeah. So, and if you remember how he was with the uh, with the, the mayor or the governor at the time, just this a lady, I forget her yes, name, that's but he, right. he completely destroyed her reputation for no reason at all. And thinking, what's this guy doing? And he goes over himself. there and starts chucking tissues at them. No, just, I, 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 just, I like it. Uh, chucking tissues at. I mean, it is incredible. It was it was undergoing a, a you know a natural disaster, and and Donald Trump turned up and started throwing out handy handies. Uh, genuinely breathtaking, but I, I like that actually. Thank you, Alex. Uh, what I like about it is that I would start, as I usually do, with the abuse of disabled people or the racist lies about Barack Obama or the abuse of the Gold Star family whose son was killed on active service and who Donald Trump publicly derided. I, I mean, I'd start with what I would call the big ticket depravities, the big ticket bigotries. In many ways, I wonder whether the little more anecdotal examples are a better illustration of the depth of his depravity. If, if you want to give me a ring and defend him, you, you're more than welcome, but I should probably warn you in advance, I do know my stuff when it comes to Donald Trump. Um, and indeed, well, it's, it's not about me. Stephen's in Islington. Stephen, what would you like to say? Morning, James. How are you doing? Pretty good, mate. Yeah, hi. I, I just want to say I'm actually a, a fan of Trump, and I think there's a lot of stuff in the media which, which are lies. Go on. Um, I know yourself, you're, you're obviously anti-Trump. You... 
Uh, now, go on. What are the lies that, that, that you're unhappy well. about? Well, no, I just think you even said this morning, you said it's OK for him... What is it, the quote you used? It's OK to be racist again? Yeah. When... when OK, so w w how do you draw that conclusion? Um, he accused Barack Obama of not having been born in America and lying about his birth certificate. So how's that racist? Birtherism is there's racist because Barack Obama there's, there's, is, is... Well, you can't... I mean, you can talk over me if you want, Stephen, previous, but, but... OK, there now have you been crack previous off. presidents that have actually been white that have also not been accused of being born in America. So well, was that also uh, racist? Uh, no, of course it wouldn't be racist. Who, who was that, by the way? Uh, I think a president from 1880. It goes, it goes back over no, no, come on, you're on national radio. Presidents. You've got your ducks in a row. T tell me about the last time an American president was accused of not being born in America. I've forgotten the names. But it, it, oh, don't be silly. Don't tease me. Of course ago. you haven't forgotten the name. You wouldn't, you wouldn't come on the radio and say something and then immediately fall apart in response to the first question you're asked. It's not, it's not, it's not falling apart. Okay, so let's go back to the name. lies that, that have been told about Donald Trump. Which one would you reach for first? Well, the one that you just said it's okay to be it's okay for the racist to come out well we've just we've just demonstrated he's very popular with racists Stephen. i think we can all agree on that well he's not popular with racists so but the, the, so the, it wasn't him. white nationalists that invaded the capital last week then uh, Steve, Steve, Bannon, yes, Steve Bannon, his key advisor, Steve Bannon, his key advisor during the presidential campaign, who's, who's now been pardoned for ripping off Trump supporters, he didn't say you should wear the accusation of racism like a badge of honour. Well, that's his quote. I mean, if that's what he's saying. But the fact that you can't just say then that everyone that marched on the Capitol is racist. I didn't. I the, said they the, were white the, nationalists. The well, you're, you're also portraying that. So let's go you. back to it's the lies, the Stephen. Let's go back to the lies that the mainstream media in America has told about Donald Trump. Well, I've just told you the fact that he's racist. But we've just proved that he is. <laughs> but, but because he's questioned someone's birth certificate, that makes him racist. No, because he questioned a black man's birth certificate, knowing that it was absolutely untrue. So that would be called a racist lie, which is encouraged to make people who are uncomfortable with Barack Obama's skin colour believe something that's not true about him because it then undermines the legitimacy of his presidency. So, it, briefly, because, I, I mean, it, it's, it's not going great, but I'd, I'd like you to stick around for a little bit longer. What, what is it you liked about him, Stephen? I think that he come out and spoke a lot of the truth on stuff. Yeah, what stuff? Does, did, will Donald Trump believe his own lies? It's, it's absolutely fascinating. And um, credit to Stephen for making the point that we open the programme with more powerfully than I think I'll ever manage to. It's, it's outrageous to suggest that Donald Trump is a racist, says a Donald Trump supporter. And then when asked what it is he likes about Donald Trump, apart from the racism, poor fella hangs up the phone. Um, but remember that that is Donald Trump's fault in a way. Uh, that is the appeal. You get some big fella who's been on the telly and who is described in the newspapers as a billionaire, and he comes along and is a massive racist. It's probably difficult to compute why you could embarrass yourself by following him or, or going along with him, or indeed ringing a national radio station to uh, uh, list all the reasons to admire him, and then once racism is being excluded, end up hanging up the phone. But hey-ho, Shane is in Cambridge. Shane, what would you like to say? Hey, James, how you doing? You okay? Yeah, pretty fantastic, actually, mate. But go uh, on, mate, over big, to you. Big fan, <laughs> big fan, big fan, mate. Just, just a quick one about Trump. Like, you're talking about the ultimate narcissist here. Like, he, he like, there was a clip doing the rounds over the last few weeks where there was, I think there was maybe a, ten different medical professionals were wheeled into the White House to meet Trump for a press up, and they, 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 they proceeded to say to him the devastation that they've been facing in their in their everyday lives during the pandemic where they were facing inordinate sort of levels of death on a daily basis. And Trump opened his top drawer and just turned around blankly and started handing them out pens. Have you seen that clip? I have. It, it, it's a little more nuanced than some of the uh, it, it coverage allows. I think he'd signed something, an executive order, and, and it, the tradition is to hand out pens to people who witness the signing of, of an executive order. But it was in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. But he, could, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't possibly have looked more disinterested. No. He was I, totally I, disdainful. He's devoid of that type of emotion that you need in a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. And it all links into his lies, his narcissism. The guy is operating on a different well, scale. Well, these, these aren't words time. I'm qualified to... I, I mean, I know, what, I know what the story of Narcissus is. He fell in love with his own reflection and all, all, all that malarkey. And I, and I know that the 
absence of empathy is a sort of psychopathic trait, the absolute inability to feel sympathy or concern or compassion for anybody. Oh, totally. Totally. That, that, yeah, I mean, the evidence is very, very compelling on that. But without resurrecting the ghost of Stephen's past, yeah. apart from the racism, why the hell did people go along with it? And tens of millions of people did go along with it. No, I get that. Uh, I'm sort of in the I'm in the club where I sort of hope that of those 75 million that voted for him, there's a big percentage that will see the error of their ways once they sort of come out of the eye of this storm. Because like Trump, there's just so much background noise with him. Yes. And ultimately, the first the first thing Biden needs to do is just dial down all of this background noise and just go back to good government. In the well, middle of I the don't know actually, and I, I quite I, it's almost refreshing not to have a strong view on this. I I, I do worry. I mean, listen, look at look at what's already happening here. Look at how many right wing politicians and members of the media are already doing a Pontius Pilate, washing their hands. Boris Johnson said he should win the Nobel Peace Prize. Jacob Rees Mogg said he should be would be our greatest ally after um, Brexit. It, the, the Andrew Neil Spectator was full of love letters to Donald Trump. Oh, yeah, I mean, I the, the media and the well, what's the name of that ridiculous woman that, that that was tweeting me? Andrea someone? Not Ledson, the other one. Oh, yeah. She she was like pro Trump. She's a conservative backbencher. They've all rewritten their Twitter biographies. So, but you just hear the way I look at it. I cast a line through the DUP at home. Of course, the, the, the right wing guys here and Trump. Like you remember Ian Paisley and these guys who was weeping in the Commons last week, yes. saying what what have we done? Why have you done this to us? Like with Brexit. Yeah, but these guys are dancing about with pro-Trump flags. Before they were the photographed outside the House of Commons with a massive pro-Trump banner, but, you know, uh, oh, no one here really liked him. We were just humouring him. We were just going along with him. I mean, it oh, is yeah, incredible yeah. So they're to all, watch. They're all wheeling, they're all re uh, wheeling backwards now at a rate of and, and that's why I don't know what the cor correct path for Biden to follow is, because it feels to me there's been a very near miss with the second term and, and with the... Uh, what would you call them? The, the forces that were unleashed at Donald Trump's incitement yes. in in Washington at the, when the Capitol was stormed, and more and more evidence emerging yeah. there. But but you don't. Biden can't just say. I mean, all of the people that were either complicit in that uh, corruption mm -hmm. or or quiet and silent, which I think, for my money, makes them complicit. They're the ones now calling for unity. In a, no, but in my opinion, in a, in a in a paradoxical way, what happened in the in up in Washington last week is going to make Biden's job more easier. Look at the way Mitch McConnell is jumping onto a different horse now. For now, yes, yeah, but I believe that that'll, that'll help Biden in sort of reaching across the aisle, doing. But what do you do to the American equivalent of my earlier caller, who is who is who is furious that the oh, um, did, invitation to be their, racist in public has no, now they, been they withdrawn? They've had their day in the sun now for four years. Yeah, all the night, all that noise will be dialed down. All that noise just needs to I dial hope you're down right. now. I hope you're these right. Guys have had, these guys have had their moment in the sun and it just needs to go back now to some sort of uh, median decorum. I hope, I, I, I hope you're right, Shane. I really do. I, it just seems to me that there's a genie all right, I'll go that full tabloid cliche. A genie has been released from a bottle and I don't know how Joe Biden is supposed to get it back in again. And the point is, of course, Trump could help, but he's skipping the inauguration today because he's such a superannuated toddler. And also because it, it is, of course, the only way he can keep alive the latest, largest lie, which is that the American election was somehow stolen from him. Now, you look at him and you watch him and you tell me whether or not, very simply, does he genuinely believe that the election was stolen from him? And I think he does. You know, I, we could find someone, if we throw open the phone lines, that thought they could catch coronavirus from a phone mast. We could find people who genuinely believe that the Earth was flat or that the moon landings had never happened or that the attacks upon the Twin Towers were an inside job. It is not hard to find these people. They're just not supposed to end up president. But you look at him talking about the election and you tell me that he knows he's lying? I just don't think he does. Fergal's in Putney. Fergal, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Good Hello, morning. Uh, always a pleasure listening to you. Well, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> um, you're talking about his, you know, what he's done. His, the, the day one, alarm bells ringing. The first thing he did was he got the um, uh, Environmental Protection Agency to remove 34,000 pages of information about climate change. Right, so from day Did he? one, he, I didn't know he, that. Yeah, I mean, I'd start, I'd start with lying about the crowd size and about the weather at the inauguration. But they, in the great scheme of things, they're probably not as significant as what you're starting with. Well, look, he, he, right, right from day one, it, he just 
set the agenda. He's going to do exactly what he wants. He doesn't give a damn about anybody. Uh, pathological liar, whatever you want to call him. The damage that he's done to this world is just absolutely shocking to his own people. 400,000 people, um, you know, passed away because of his uh, <laughs> stupidity. But with climate science, he's been denying science from day one. And in, in his term, the last five years, we've had like, have been like the hottest years on record. Uh, 2016 and 2020 joint, uh, you know, their, their pole position for the hottest ever. Yeah. $90 billion worth of damage just in 2020 from hurricanes, forest fires, storms in the United States alone, right? And what does he do? He goes and he puts in a uh, oil and gas person into NOAA, which what? is NASA. It's the it, National Oceanic... Uh, and and, and he starts talking it's about black blame. Rubbish. No, I get that. But, yeah. but what's your answer to the why of it, Fergal? Because... The, the why, because he, he, look, um, you know, oil and gas are the people who put him in power. It's, it's mm. money's put him in power. Uh, he... He doesn't even think what he's doing is lying. It's, it's just, uh, it's just a way of a bullying to get exactly what he wants to get control. He will do anything, anything in his path. And Science the people who bankrolled him, and this is why, of course, we've got so many problems in this country with secretly funded lobbyists and, and so-called think tanks, because the people uh, that 50, bank bankrolled five Tufton Street. I, yeah. I, I mean, well, you could say that. I couldn't possibly that comment. One. But the, but I mean, the link between climate science, Trump, Brexit. It is. I mean, it's 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 cast in. It's it's, it's ironclad that link. But the, the 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 ordinary person in the street probably needs more help. I think I do actually in fully grasping because of the self damage that's involved in it. You know, fossil fuels and global warming, uh, anthropocentric climate change, all of these things they kill us all in the end. They kill all of our children. Oh, well, then we're back to the pathology exactly. on it, aren't we of course so i don't care it's not going to kill me my my, 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 my unborn great grandchildren might all have to live on the top of a mountain and, and and fight over food but i'll be long gone and 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 i've made america great again so the attitude to the environment is perhaps the best example of the sociopathic nature of the man it completely and utterly and he, the damage that he's done by standing there and waving, going, climate change, what climate change? Yeah. It's, got, it's getting Belie pretty, ah, it, it, and then it's, it's, so it's he, pretty cold in here. Yeah, of course. Well, you used to have, you know, uh, people in the right-wing media saying, oh, it's it's snowing today, what's happened to global warming? And, and they'd end up editing newspapers. So it's not confined to Trump. I, I, ignorance is far from confined to Trump. But there's two things going on. Why is he doing that? Answer presumably dark money or being bankrolled by the kind of um, uh, fossil fuel billionaires that control huge swathes of the planet. Why do people go along with it? Well, because we don't want to believe that it's true. I, I, you know, I want to fly to Tahiti every weekend. I, I don't at me, all right? I, I don't know much about Tahiti. But I, you see what I mean? I want to d drive around in a big gas-guzzling car. I don't want to worry about this. I don't, I don't want to have to do the blinking recycling. Oh, my God, it was bin day today, and I forgot. Anyway, I digress slightly. And, and that's the offer he makes to people that goes beyond racism, perhaps. So you, you, it's not just racists that will forgive Donald Trump's depravity. It's also idiots. Absolute nonsense, James. Donald knows full well he's lying about the election. His call to the Georgia Secretary of State about finding votes proves it. He just can't believe he lost. I think she... I, I listen, it's a slightly pedantic stroke semantic contemplation, but I think you contradict yourself there. I, I, I don't think he can believe he lost, you see, and therefore he does believe he won. So he doesn't think he's lying. And if you listen to that telephone conversation, I, I, a bit like Pretty Patel's 400,000 documents that have disappeared, but she said today that they're working very hard to find them. So if everyone could just check down the back of their sofas, that would be a great help for the Home Secretary. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, and we'll never know for sure. But I, I think somehow, if you persuade yourself of a lie, then you must also persuade yourself that the evidence... That it's not a lie exists. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We shall see. Uh, anyway, 10.50, how do you account for Trump? Do you think he realise, realises he was lying? And apart from the racism, whatever else was there to like? Steve's in Watford. Steve, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, uh, first time calling into your show, but Welcome. listen to it uh, daily. Um, I was a Trump fan. I, I don't want to say I was a big Trump supporter, but okay. I was certainly um, a fan of the anti-establishment Trump, the caricature that, that, that was coming through, um, you know, to, in 2014, 2015. 
and um, slowly but surely that uh, the optimism that I had in Trump faded and um, I'd like to really end of 2019, beginning of 2020 when the pandemic started is really due to his response and that when I started to see the light, so I, to speak, and, and realise that I was um, really... I, I, I salute your propaganda. honesty. I, no, I, I do salute your honesty and you've already used the P word but and, and, and I don't want to barbecue you, I really don't, but when I list that litany of... Well, what to me is evidence of profound moral depravity, the, the abuse of the disabled journalist, the boasting about sexually assaulting women, the comments he made about his own daughter, the, 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 the denigration of, of the Gold Star family, the, the insulting of, of John McCain, who was a, a genuine war hero and, and also refused early release because he wanted to stay with his men, in, I think, in a, in a Vietnamese jungle. I, I mean, I could go on, and I frequently do. How... How did you manage to close your eyes to all that, mate? Um, I believe at the time, the big contributing factor for me was yes. Reddit. Oh, and, okay, so, um, so, so you were down a bit of a online rabbit hole then? Well, at one point, the Donald was the largest Reddit um, you know, that, that, that they had on that site. They, um, they tried to hide it. They tried to hide all the new posts from the front page. And in the end, the entire, um, the entire really. sub was... Was deleted. You're not that, really that answering so, my it, question, are you? Because I, I just listed a few things that would have given sure. pause to most people and, and certainly yeah. persuaded me from day one that the man had absolutely no suitability or fitness for power. And, and you, well, under your own analysis, you gave him a free pass on all that stuff. No, I, um, I, I wouldn't say a free pass, but what I did do was mm. I saw these stories coming through and I was reading them online through my right. sort of new source of choice, yes. through the lens of... Um, okay. of the Donald, uh, yes. and, and then, and, and everything you've just said about Senator McCain, about the Gold Star Generals, there were um, Captain, opposite was, views. Um, yes, but they can't Sorry, have been, because were... it was all on tape. I mean, we used to play the tapes, which, I mean, the visual tape, which I can't play on the radio, of him actually doing m m mimes designed to mock a disabled journalist. I mean, what's the, how do you balance that one out? What's the other side of that coin? I would say clever propaganda causing me to, to have mental gymnastics. Yeah, you know, yeah. Looking at other people's views that, that now I can see were not true, but at the time, I dismissed them and, and took them as, um, you know, as, as true. Well, you're, um, you're, you're my, sort of, in many ways, my, my, my favourite caller because you are describing your own decision to ignore the evidence of your eyes and ears and instead believe what Donald Trump was telling you. Yeah, c correct. I, okay. I, I, I was totally biased. I was totally biased, and, and I believe that the... There was a lot of, I don't want to use the P word again, but th there was certainly a lot of stuff online that caused even well, semi-intelligent people such as myself, uh, <laughs> if I could categorise myself like that. <laughs> if you are, then I otherwise, am. Yes, okay. Otherwise, and finally... You know, and, 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 and that's terrifying. I, and it is terrifying, and, and it's wonderful in many ways to hear, hear you say that, because there are times when people like me wonder whether people like you ever get out of the, of, of the darkness. And, and your namesake earlier, of course demonstrated what happens if, if you don't try to or you don't want to but my final question then is and i hope you won't take this the wrong way what was it about you that made you susceptible to the p word to the propaganda do you think hand on heart um yeah i okay i think uh you, you, you <laughs> internet memes james that's what but we've is. all seen the ridiculous. internet memes we've internet all memes. we've all been exposed to the entry to the rabbit hole. There must be something so, different from you and him over there to dive down it. I think I, I just, maybe I'm more susceptible to it. I found them funny, I found yeah. it interesting, I found it a little bit anti-establishment. I lived in the US for, for the best part of eight years. Yeah. Um, under the Obama administration, I had my own thoughts about how, how the country was run and governed and at that time, which obviously you don't need to go into now, but no, I, 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 was, I was already on, you know, on I, that... Uh, I feel nothing Not but admiration right. for you yeah. today. Nothing but admiration for your honesty. But I'd I, I just roll one more dice, if I may. What about the birtherism? Because I think historians of the future yeah. will point at that yeah. and say that was the moment that he won the election, really. The moment when he was allowed to tell those racist lies about Barack Obama and still get invited onto talk shows and still get treated like a respectable human being and still be fated in, 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 well, I'm afraid I have to say this, Steve, is still fated by much of the so-called establishment that you felt he represented a rebellion against. So why did you 
I won't say a free pass, I just overlook. How could you overlook the birtherism? And a lot of people did, so there's no... No, no, I'd, I'd be to- totally upfront and honest. I, yeah. I've, I've read the, well, I've also read the transcripts and seen the video where, you know, it's where Obama himself mentioned something about um, about Kenya, about mm. being from from there. I yeah. think it was in a, uh, you know, university speech. And, you know, if it's a, a slip of the tongue, a Freudian slip, whatever it is, I've seen that and I've made up my mind that, oh, actually, there's something going on there. Maybe okay. he is. Wow. Maybe he, maybe he isn't. Yeah, and I and think so that, that little nugget, that, 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 there, that, that tiny nugget of plausibility, you can then build a whole castle on top of, a whole castle. Mental of, gymnastics. Cr- yeah, it, you use that phrase gymnastics. and I salute you for it. I really do. I, I, I hope my sincerity is coming across clearly. I'm not being facetious or sarcastic or glib in any way. I, I thank the Lord that people like you can make the journey that you've made. And, and while I remain fascinated by how you end up at the bottom of the rabbit hole, how you climb out of it is obviously of much more urgency and importance. And, and that's why, I mean, essentially, Steve, I don't know, finally, whether you'd accept this word, you've kind of de-radicalised yourself. I, I think that would be a step too far for me. To oh, okay, to well, I, I, I think I, you I, could I, help I, other people, perhaps, but um, I'm grateful to you for your honesty. I really am, eh? because without the honesty, Trump wins, even if he has lost the election. 10.57 is the time. Alan's in Liverpool. Alan, what's your take on all this? Hi, James. Um, he's become institutionalised. What does that mean? To, him, to himself. Since birth, he's been told everything he does thinks, feels, wants, is correct. Now, if you bring a child up and tell them every single thing they do is wrong, Mm. then they'll believe that every single thing they do is wrong. Conversely, if you tell them everything you do and think and feel is right, then they'll believe that they're always right Uh, all the time. So basically, we've got a 70-odd-year-old, six-foot-three spoiled brat. He is used to getting his own way yes. his entire life. He doesn't know anything else. I, I, I would question one thing, oddly, and, and Freud, yeah. of course, was um, uh, probably not wrong when he dragged almost everything back to, to, to childhood and uh, mummy-daddy issues. I don't know that he was constantly told. I, I suspect he had a fairly brutal upbringing from his father's point of view, and he got, I think, sent away oh, yeah, to military so, school. So he builds yeah. a facade of false confidence so the way he survives the trauma of his childhood and this is why i can you know uh, with a long run-up muster up some sympathy for the fella he he survived the traumas of his childhood by creating a completely false personality which objective truth doesn't play a part in yeah yeah no i agree with that I, i mean i'm not saying he was told all the time that he was right and everything he wanted. He created a universe habit. around him Be- that kept because, telling him he was no, no. right. What I'm saying is, um, I don't think he was, that was done to him out of love. No. I think that was done to him out of, you are a Trump, therefore everything you do is correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's become muscle memory, basically. And he just doesn't know different, which means you probably yes. join me in cautiously concluding that he actually believes the lies that he tells everybody else. Oh, he absolutely does, yeah. because that's the way he's been conditioned. As I say, muscle memory, he's had 73 years of everything you do and feel is right because you're a Trump. Yeah, I I mean, it's simultaneously simple and terrifyingly sophisticated, but it's also very, very plausible. Benji says he's a mythomaniac. That's a lovely word. A pathological liar who believes he's correct on everything. I'll never forget how he thought that the cure for COVID could be bleaching with detergents, the innards of any poor individual who'd been infected, or the use of a strongly bright light. Again, you know, going back to Stephen, the second Stephen, talking about you, you just take a grain of sand that has a veneer of credibility, and then you build on all of that. Because there are, I mean, light can be used to clean facilities, not, not people. So he, he's heard something. And, and then it becomes an intellectual, perhaps, rather than a psychological problem that he has, in, in that he's not clever enough to realise how stupid he is. I, I mean, if you're confused by some of the coverage, I'm afraid the only conclusion I've been able to arrive at, and I am always open to being led by the nose or the hand towards other conclusions, is, is that people liked what Donald Trump represented. The weird thing for me, historically, is that they never quite pushed it to the next level. They never took up Steve Bannon's invitation to wear the accusation of racism as a badge of honour. I said to you a few times over the last few years that that's going to be the pivot if people actually start and a couple of people who I I won't 
sully your ears by saying their names out loud. But but the kind of people that get banned manage to get banned from Twitter. I mean, absolute sewer of a social media site. And to get banned from there, as of course the President of the United States of America has managed to do, your racism has to move into a realm that renders it completely beyond question. I mean, absolutely and utterly crystal clear, not just the racism, of course, but also the incitement to racial hatred or the incitement to violence. So the kind of people that get banned from Twitter were probably prepared to do that. Yes, call me a racist. I am a racist. And, and I don't know why. It gives me hope. Joanna, it gives me hope that that next gear never got found. You know, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying I love my country. The love I have for my country does not involve hating other countries or hating other people. I mean, it's Martin Luther King territory, isn't it? You, you don't chase out hate with hate, you chase it out with love. But I, I don't think... I think if someone in this country had turned up, even on a far-right march, even on the, 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 the racist marches that took place after the Black Lives Matter process, protests, if someone had turned up in a cat, well, no, there you're going to send me pictures of Nazi tattoos, aren't you? But a Camp Auschwitz t-shirt, one of those capital protesters, insurrectionists, terrorists, actually. For, they're terrorists, of course they are. I know some people aren't comfortable with that word because they're not brown, but, but they, they are terrorists. If someone here turned up in a Camp Auschwitz t-shirt, you have to hope that even the... I don't know, actually, but I hope stroke believe that even, you know, the, 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 the kind of people who are flirting with far-right ideologies and surprisingly comfortable with fascistic tactics and, and, and ideas, if someone turned up in your midst, on your, you know, your, your Down With Immigrants March or whatever it was, if someone was actually wearing a Camp Auschwitz t-shirt, I think you'd turn on him, wouldn't you? I don't know. But I, I have to believe that you would, actually. I think the alternative is too bleak. The alternative is America. Seven minutes after 11 is the time, or at least Trump's America. And the question of whether he believes his own lies and, and whether he did actually offer anything to anybody that wouldn't eventually lead back to the racism that, in his case, had been clear for decades. I think it was in, uh, it was in 1973 that the Department of Justice found evidence that he'd refused to rent to black tenants and lied to black housing applicants about whether apartments were available. Um... You know, anyone says he's not a racist, there's no proof. They are ignoring the evidence of their eyes and ears, which was infamously the party's final most terrible command. Susan Wimborne. Sue, what would you like to say? Oh. Hello. Hi. Hello, hello. Um, I'd like to say I think it's likely that he believes his own lies. Yeah, I do. Um, I think it's highly likely that he scores up a narcissistic personality disorder and as people have said beforehand a number of experts kind of agree with that likelihood and I think why he has to believe his own lies is because he's a very rigid um, black and white thinker as goes with the trait of narcissism and for him the world is really divided between winners and losers and if you're not a win winner then there's only one place to be and that's a loser and it's intolerable for him to actually go there to contemplate that um, he, he's not grandiose and special and brilliant. So we're wasting our time, or I'm wasting my time. I sense you have some psychological training. Yeah, I was a clinical psychologist for go. 30 years. That, that'll do, that with... counts. But but, but, okay. but I'm not, obviously. And, and it, it's almost as if listening to you, I feel, not that I'm wasting my time, but that I, I'll never fully understand or, or be able to fully answer the questions I'm asking without your sort of pedigree uh, and your training, or, alternatively, without, I don't know, feeling about the world the same way that he feels. Yeah, I understand that. And I think he would be a very 
tough nut to crack in the clinic. Um, never underestimate the power of denial, really. No. Well, that's it, isn't um, it? And that, that's, that's yeah. I mean, that is it. He is being confronted with incontrovertible evidence that black yeah, is black. Absolutely. And he is insisting, Not it's not even to the room, it's to himself is the most important insistence that actually black is white. Absolutely. And, I mean, for you, I mean, you hinted at it earlier when you said, I don't really want to buy the climate change. Because if I buy the climate change, it means I've got to think twice about whether or not I take uh, that holiday in the sun in the winter. Yes. But for him, his whole sense of being and who he is, it's not about holidays, it's about who I am. And if he, if he confronts that delusion that he is grandiose and special mm. and entitled, then it's almost like a self-annihilation. So you he know, can't go told, there, he can't go there. Everything, his, his there. very identity really would crumble. Absolutely. <laughs> He would crumble, and that's what you see if you're working in the clinic. Yes. And you're working with people that have that grandiosity. It's like a big meringue, but actually <laughs> it's very fragile. Yes. Because when you pierce it, it kind of crumbles in the middle and collapses. And that's why he comes out swinging so viciously and so violently at even relatively mild criticism, because if oh, he lets absolutely. the light in, absolutely. it falls apart. It's called narcissistic rage. Okay. And for that reason, it's kind of dangerous, because he will lash out and attempt to destroy anybody that threatens his own delusions about himself and delusions about himself because deep down he knows that it's delusional and and opening that little trap door of, of honesty would yeah, destroy him I or think, i think knowing is kind of on a continuum yes yes um I understand. it's not a black and white thing and you can recognize it because you're not a black and white thinker mm. but for him he is it all kind of hangs together with this categorical view of the world of himself and of humanity so you know he can't afford and it kind of hangs together with how you view other people you've hinted at that yeah. like how how can he dehumanize people it's because of this sort of black and white yes. categorical thinking that human beings aren't complex they aren't made up of being both strong and vulnerable and wise and and unwise and uncertain um it's it all hangs together as you've kind of hinted at uh, nudged, before. nudged towards without the benefit of your your qualifications or indeed your clinical experience uh, the, 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 and, and of course then briefly to move into the uh, realms of the supporter rather than the leader presumably although they don't have the narcissistic traits or the or the sociopathic perhaps traits they do share or even want to believe that the world is black and white. So I took a call. I think that's right. I took I a call a couple of right. years ago that haunts me to this day. From a I, I, Donald Trump was in London lying through his teeth uh, about protest. I mean, literally lying on live television. And and I took a call. I think he was called Stephen as well. There's a theme emerging here. And and I, I I really saluted his honesty because I was saying how how why do you let him get away with this? If you like Donald Trump, what on earth are you getting in return? That sees you letting his lies go unchallenged or even cheered to the rafters and he said to me he said i love it because it upsets people like you and sadiq khan now, now that that fits into your model of binary polarization i think absolutely good lord absolutely and there it it's is it's kind of comforting to think that way and is it it doesn't comfort me to... No, no, I understand that, and it doesn't comfort me either, but for these people not to have to face the fear, 
for example, of the panic, uh, the planet being destroyed. You know, these are why these things hang together, not to have to face your own helplessness. Oh, or just the complexity of the world, perhaps, Sue, exactly. sometimes. Like, it's almost exactly as if... That. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the it, it, these lies, these slogans, these bigotries, these prejudices, exactly they, they excuse that. people the inconvenience of having to think about things. Exactly that. It is both sophisticated and, at the same time, very simple. God, oh, there it the is. The power of denial. Yeah. The, the power of... Do you feel nothing. sorry for him? Um, mm, <laughs> probably <laughs> if I met him in the clinic. Yes. I mean, I didn't yes. know that he'd had a brutal childhood. You've done more reading on him than I have. Yes. Um, so very often, if if you kind of you hear about these people and it recruits your anger and your contempt for them, but then when you meet them and you hear their story yeah. and you kind of understand, it recruits your empathy. But uh, you know, yeah, I'm yeah, sure yeah. now I will go and read books and find out a little bit about him. And I'm sure I, I will, but... Uh face value no I well, just, yeah no i get i get that and yeah, this will i mean this is your field not mine but it, it, i'm a great believer that no one's born full of hate Do donald trump something was no. done to him to make him like I that i agree and, with and you i agree with I, I you there is a story and and probably behind all of them that fall into his camp that if we knew their histories, so if we understood yes. the cultures that they grew up in, we'd be able to give a plausible account as to what fed and drove. But um, they are they are meanwhile thinking. putting so much effort into convincing themselves not only that there's nothing wrong with them, but that they're golden, they're special, they're magnificent, that that uh, they're never going to let the light in, uh, and, and there's not a lot that anyone else can do, including professionals like yourself, until somebody actually wants to be helped, and that would admit involve admitting vulnerability, which is the polar opposite, as you've explained, of, of what Donald Trump is is capable of doing. And, and maybe people who are confused and frightened and angry, like, well, they do, we know, because they ring me, not as much as they used to, but they, they, they still do. Um, uh, they, they like the idea that, that the world is simple, and the enemy is clear, and... I do love being lied to because it upsets people like you and Sadiq Khan. Sue, a lot of love coming in for you on, on, on my text and my social media, understandably, because that was an absolute masterclass for which I join the chorus of gratitude. F fascinating conversation, this. And, and it feels different, doesn't it, from occasions in the past where we may have had it, because at least the imminent threat of Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump's flirtations with fascism being fully consummated in a, in a second term in America has has gone away but the 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 what would you call them the the forces that propelled him into the white house have clearly not gone away and you know even after presiding over the avoidable deaths of hundreds of thousands of people and seeing his bigotries and his racism rendered unchallengeable 70 odd million americans still voted for him so you know it, I, if, forgive me for not popping champagne corks at the thought that the most powerful country on the planet um <sighs> still really lives under the yoke of white supremacism it, it is actually incredible to reflect upon but you take your wins where you find them and at the moment the forces of white nationalism white supremacism racism bigotry misogyny um and it, it, various phobias are in retreat I, I tweeted yesterday that that because i you know i'm very amused by the way that the word woke has been co-opted by uh, chiefly by people who uh, object to the descriptions of Donald Trump's depravity that, that snowflakes like me have been uh, bravely indulging in for the last four or five years so I, I can't remember exactly what I said but it was something along the lines of um, you know the depravity was clear from the start that they've only invented this word woke to try and insult people who were describing and calling out the depravity. And a couple of hours later, Mike Pompeo, clearly of Italian heritage, Mike Pompeo actually, I mean, proved my point in a way that is, is, is unbelievable. He wrote, wokeism, multiculturalism, all the isms, hmm, not quite all the isms there, Mickey. There'd be fascism, racism, wouldn't there?
But anyway, uh, wokeism, multiculturalism, all the isms, they're not who America is. They distort our glorious founding and what this country is all about. Our enemies stoke these divisions because they know they make us weaker. So there it is. I mean, the word woke is essentially... And, and you have to exclude the trans debate from this observation. I, I do explain at length why in my latest book, so don't at me. Well, woke is essentially a word that means anti-racist. Don't let anyone kid you otherwise, all right? That, that's all it means. I heard Lisa Nandy on, on earlier with Nick, and, and she uses the word very unapologetically, very casually, and she's dead right to do so. It's been demonised in the same way that virtue got demonised by the phrase virtue signalling, which I think first appeared in Andrew Neil's Spectator. Um, is the politically correct got demonised because people didn't like being told to stop being racist and all the lies about Winterville and, and, and Union flags being taken down. Uh, followed on from the demonization of decency under the banner of political correctness. And and then woke came along, a, a word that literally means pro-equality, uh, uh, alive to injustice and inequality. And that, of course, as, as Mike Pompeo, presumably the, the, the descendant of immigrants himself, um, demonstrates in that tweet. It, it just means anti I mean, It kind of means anti-Trump, of course, but being anti-Trump is being anti-racist. <laughs> And, and, and forgive me, nobody's perfect, but who else is really enjoying the attempts, to, the, the, the acrobatics being undertaken by people who were cheering him to the rafters ten minutes ago and now pretending it had nothing to do with them at all. It's as if Shaggy, the spirit of Shaggy, has infected the commentating class and much of the Conservative Party. Oh, it wasn't me. But you're literally on tape. Dude, I've seen your Twitter profile with all the hashtags on it. What are you talking about? There's pictures of you wearing his merchandise. Oh, yeah, well, you know. Uh, we were just humouring him. It was irony. It was, uh, Boris Johnson said he should win the Nobel Prize. Yeah, but, you know. And Jacob Rees-Mogg said he'd be our greatest ally after Brexit. Jacob Rees-Mogg met up with Steve Bannon after, I think, Bannon had said that thing about wearing the accusation of racism as a badge of honour. <laughs> So forgive me for enjoying a, a, a moment of vindication. Although, as I said a moment ago, it's, it's the vindication that's very, very quickly excised by the thought of how close we came and what might have been and what could still, of course, occur. There's a Sinclair Lewis book written, I think, in the 20s or the 30s called It Couldn't Happen Here. I wish everyone had read it five years ago. Tony's in Dublin. Tony, welcome. Morning, James. How are you? I'm grand. What's on your mind? I've done it already. I Good. get a caller from Dublin yeah. and, and I introduce the word grand into my vocabulary. I never use it in any other circumstances. Can I apologise to you for that? It's ridiculous. <laughs> Cultural stereotyping. We are, we, 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 are, we are what we are, James. Don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> what do you want to say? <laughs> I was going to say, I can't follow Sue. It's like being asked to go on after Sinatra. Yeah, yeah, she was fantastic, situation. wasn't she? Absolutely yeah, fantastic. Absolutely but she's a professional and we're amateurs, so we're okay. We're yeah, exactly, okay. yes. <laughs> and uh, about to be proven so. <laughs> but the um, uh, point I want to make about Trump, actually, James, and not on the thing you were just saying, was that I think people tend to ignore the amount of it that's performative. Yes. And that he is a liar. He's always been a liar and things like that. But if you look at... What's the TV show called? The uh, The Apprentice. Yes. They have Apprentice Trump, the wrestling guy Trump, the actor Trump, the real estate agent Trump. And I think politician Trump does the sum that says, well, politicians lie, so I'm going to do it on a nuclear scale. And Yeah, and, and that perception what, uh, of all yeah. politicians being, being dodgy by being even yeah. dodgier than all of them while claiming that he's the only one that isn't dodgy, there's a, there's a sort of symmetry to the con that, that's clear. There's a, there's a three-card multi to it. Absolutely, yeah, there is indeed. The, um, I think that he, you know, maybe the line would be, they all stab me in the back, at least he's stabbing me in the face, that kind of idea yes. that can go into his appeal. But I think a huge amount of what he does, he knows exactly what he's doing. I'm not speaking strategically. I mean, just in terms of, I will put out a story that fits the narrative, I will tell a lie that fits the yeah, narrative. Yeah, in, in the sense that it, it doesn't happen by accident, it, 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 it is yes. what you mean. It's the, it, And that's, I mean, at every stage, whether he's trying to sell steaks i think at one point he was flogging frozen steaks so he did basically stick his name on anything wouldn't he and and and, yeah. and, and the trump yeah. university i mean the evidence of just how i thought sue's description of a meringue it describes not just his personality but also his public image it, 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 the meringue is look at that magnificent meringue but whatever you do don't touch it because it'll fall apart like it'll fall yeah absolutely and i think it's a because of his 
ability to maybe to adapt to whatever role he needs to adapt to. This is just a nuclear level role that he's playing in a hu- to a huge extent, and yeah. I think that's really, really, it's really, really appealing to the people who are. Well, that, you think of a comparison. Yeah, oh, the, the, the invitation to them becomes the invitation to blame your whole life on somebody else, whether it's Mexicans yeah. or Muslims or migrants or, or, or snowflakes or liberals or woke people or whatever it is. It's, it's, I, I'm really unhappy. I'm really angry. And I don't want it to be my fault or, or the result of the votes I've cast over the course of my lifetime for parties that are generally doing the bidding of the... The plutocrat. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to bite your arm off if you invite me to blame it all on my Mexican neighbours or, or, or my Democrat voting colleagues. Let me. Well, so you, I, 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 sorry, James. I, I understand what you mean, and it's a that if if you forgive me, there's some it's somewhat simplistic. Doesn't give the devil as due in that situation. It's a bit <laughs> maybe simplistic in that it's a uh, the people who there are obviously those people who say blame it on the Mexicans, blame it on mm. blame it on everybody except yourself. But there is also the idea that. If you are, like you and I are both middle-aged men, if we live somewhere in Pennsylvania and the factory is closed down and we haven't had a job for 30 years, why wouldn't I blame it on somebody new? You know, it's a... Yeah, no, it, of course, it, of course, You know, course. There, is, there is an appeal to it, you know, as in there's a justification... Yeah, and the factories have moved to the Middle East and they are importing yeah. from China. So you always need a little kernel of truth. You take yes, a, exactly. a tiny nugget of fact and then you drown it in false feelings or feelings that are built yes. on falsehoods and it becomes a very intoxicating brew. Speaking of falsehoods, have you seen what the Daily Telegraph uh, or, or a Daily Telegraph writer has written today about Ireland? <laughs> the Daily Telegraph in Ireland in the same sentence can be quite upsetting. Are you James, telling but me? On, me. As a, but but <laughs> the, um, let me just read you this. Biden's great-great-great-grandfather, Edward Blewett, left Ballina County Mayo Island for America during the Irish famine 170 years ago, which could mean he is well disposed towards Great Britain. <laughs> well, you've got to admire it on one level, don't you? You've got to admire it on one level. <laughs> you do. It could be a joke, in which case, of course, it's a very, very good one, as you could tell from Tony's reaction. But it has been served up with a very straight face. Tony, God bless you. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. You should, of course, listen to Eddie Mayer every day from four o'clock on LBC. But today it should be on prescription as uh, Eddie and the company of Simon Marks and many others get stuck into that unfolding inauguration, that unprecedented inauguration. Unprecedented off the top of my head for two reasons. Number one, it's taking place during a pandemic, so the crowds in the mall will uh, simply not be there. And number two, the outgoing president is too much of a superannuated toddler to turn up. I mean, that, that, I mean that's the moment, isn't it? Again, how many times have I said that to you? That's the moment where you have to see how naked the emperor actually is. And the only circumstances in which you could possibly excuse Donald Trump's petulance on this occasion is if you, like him, are still claiming that the election was somehow stolen. He can't turn up because to turn up is to legitimise or validate the election. This is how his mind works. And that means that even if you've stayed with him right up until this point, but you know the election wasn't stolen, this is the point at which you go, my God, he really is all the things that his critics said he was. He is absolutely pathetic. What, what was that, Mr. President? I'm not going, I'm not going to the inauguration of the next, I mean, it's right up there with I've got a girlfriend, but she goes to another school, right? I mean, we just know this stuff. It's so weird and so scary for, for those of us who are literally describing, photographing and, uh, uh, broadcasting the nudity, the undeniable nudity of the emperor, and and you find yourself suddenly working in a profession or working even in a building where people are insisting that he's wearing splendiferous new robes and that he's not naked at all. And you, you sort of say, there have been moments. I interviewed Tim Roth last night, which is a real career highlight, I have to tell you. It's going to be on full disclosure next week. I don't know what you've been doing on Zoom, getting annoyed with the head of sales or something like that. I sat in our back bedroom on a Zoom call with Tim Roth last night. So you, you, you literally, one of the greatest actors of the last God knows how many decades, just sitting in my laptop, chatting about, I nearly used a rude word there, but you can work out. I mean, it was just nuts. And, and he loves the show. So you also have that moment where you go, he didn't, I mean, he just, he, oh, all right, you just got to watch it. I'm going to go all fanboy and, and, and teenage on this one. But if, if, you know, if you watch Made in Britain, 
And uh, I got messages yesterday of, of two actors, Eddie Mars and Andrew Fasciol, both saying, both from working class backgrounds and both describing what, what Tim Roth meant to them and what that particular TV film, Alan Clark's, made in Britain men and the story of how he got the part I don't know if he's told it before and I'm not even going to check because I don't want to know if he has but, but but man alive it just went by like that I've never known an interview to fly past so quickly and I think Ava how many words would you say I said in the course of that I think I said about 40 words in the course of the entire interview I did a lot of laughing I did a lot of, lot of laughing <laughs> but I did I barely spoke what a legend Oh, man. Anyway, I did that last night. I don't know what you were up to. Probably watching EastEnders. Joe's in Guildford to steer us back to the to, to the Trump questions. Joe, what would you like to say? Hello, mate. Um, first time caller, first welcome, call. I'm a uh, big fan. Oh, thank you. Um, just a quick one I wanted to say. Basically, yeah. I think that he does believe everything that he does say. Yeah. Um, in the same way that people like Hitler and Stalin believe what they were doing and was right, um, Ted Kaczynski thought that um, civilization was going to come to an end due to technology, so he put his plan into action. I mean, all of these people. Who, who was he? Was he? Was he the, the the Unabomber? The, the Unabomber. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, so I'm not for one minute trying to draw a conclusion where they're similar characters. Obviously, the severity of their actions are completely different. Mm. But them believing their own lies and their own ideology, I think that comparison can be drawn. Yes, in yes. the sense that. Well, right, do you know what you've done? You, you, this is, I think this is a first, Joe. For a first-time caller, this is quite an achievement. You've pushed me into a position where I'm poised to defend Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I don't think that he did. I think, he, I think the Jews were a very useful scapegoat for Hitler. I don't know that he actually believed that a four-year-old girl from the Polish ghettos was a threat to German civilization. I, I mean, he probably believed the stuff about... You, you know, control and money, or he probably persuaded yeah. himself of it, and that's the seed from which the Holocaust grew. Yeah, so I mean, the, the initial yeah. idea um, yeah. was you know, built on a genuine belief. A genuine belief. Thought. Yeah, exactly. The similar to um, a lot of crazy people in history yeah. um, that, you know, regardless of their level of intelligence, they still believe that their ideology was the correct way to move forward. And they're going to do everything they can to defend that. Um, you know, I I don't think that if you ask Trump, oh, do, do you think kids should be in cages? I don't think he'd say, yes, let's put kids in cages. But if you asked him to justify the immigration policies, he would be able to do that because the immigration side of the argument, he has a genuine belief in. I, well, I disagree with you on that. I, 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 but but that's, that's for the birds. It doesn't matter what, what, whether we agree or disagree on that. I don't know on the cages one. I, 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 I think it's about will they like it? Will the MAGA crowd I, like it? And if they like it, I love it. I think. Performing for the audience. Yeah. It's, yeah, interesting. And you, um, need, you, know, you need to have a complete absence of empathy even to contemplate it. The idea of, of separating families, even more so than the cages. The separation, the deliberate separation of families. The last time I checked, there was still 600 that hadn't been reunited. Deliberately separating babies, children from their, from their mums and dads. That, when... I think the calculation was simply... How will it affect me? And the conclusion, the calculation, that the, the result that dropped out at the bottom of the calculation was MAGA, that crowd of people who our earlier caller insisted weren't racist, they will love it. They will love it. <laughs> well, I think it. It's, it's similar in the sense that the people that stormed the Capitol building, I reckon that they genuinely believed that they were doing something that was just and That's right. for sure, yeah. And, you know, a lot of people who do crazy things have that ID, um, idea that, that what they're doing is right when the majority of the time they're not correct, but that doesn't change yeah. their own perception of the event. Yeah, I, I mean, in many ways, I've, I've got more sympathy for the insurrectionists and the terrorists that, that were there that day for precisely the reason you described, because they have... You know, he's the President of the United States of America. It wasn't that long ago that most of us would have thought, well, I don't like it or I don't necessarily agree with it, but he's not going to be a, a completely barefaced liar. He's not going to stand in front of me holding a, a tire iron claiming it's an ice cream. Do you know what I mean? That level yeah. of lies. I, I, I mean, th th there is, it's happened so quickly. So I got a little, but with him, I think it's deeper. I think it's more psychological and, and your historical parallels are incredibly powerful. I look forward to your next call, Joe. And and I think I just resisted that. I don't think I I don't think Joe turned me into a, a defender of Adolf Hitler or a Hitler apologist. But um, 
Well, I've never had that feeling before in the course of a phone conversation. So thank you, mate. Let's head back to Galway. First of all, um, hopefully Pierce can help me correctly pronounce that town in Mayo that I've apparently been butchering all morning. Can you help me with that, Piers? Yeah, I, was, I was wondering whether I would or not, but being married to a very proud male woman, it's Balina. Balina. Uh, not Balina. Balina. No, no. Thank yeah. you. So exactly. I'm glad we cleared that one up. See, people are always welcome to call in and correct me. What else did you want to say, Piers? Um, the first question you asked this morning was, do you think Trump uh, believes his lies? Mm. Now, I think, I've been hanging on for a while, so I was listening to Susan there, and I think if she got his, her hands on him, she probably would... Uh, change my opinion on that. But I think on the surface of it, mm. I think he does. Yeah, yeah. And why would I think that? So he throws the out. First thing I remember was the crowd the, at, the, at his inauguration. Yes. And it was particularly low. And it was the biggest crowd ever. So yes. I said, right, here's the first lie now. And what happens then is it goes to the media. And this is the media he consumes. Remember this. He tells the lie. Nobody surrounding him will criticise him, with probably the notable exception of Mitt Romney. But nobody. Kayleigh McEnany or Helen Huckabee Sanders at the time, Sean Spicer, all those people. Yes, sir, no, sir. And then he goes back to his bedroom and he switches on Fox News. And they do one of three things. They either back up the lie, they ignore the news item, or they agree with the lie that it was a lie, but they make excuses for it. Yes. And he watches that for four or five hours every day. Yes. And he emerges again with his chest out because he's got confirmation of what he said. I, I did, yeah. And that continued on for four years. And every time I'd look at it and say, right, okay, he's done the bleach thing. This is it. Mm. This has to be. Yeah, you and me both. You and me both. You and me both. They got it. <laughs> no, they're still not. And they even think, is, is it possible to inject bleach? Yeah. Or, it, you know, and then what happens is he's on the same algorithm as me or you when he, when he um, digests, say, Facebook Watch and, mm. and, and social media. Mm. So if he's watching someone like um, Ben Shapiro, mm. he'd be then shoved on to a guy called Charlie Cox, a um, college educated kid. Yes. That's one box ticked. Then he goes to Charlie Kirk, who has no college education. Another box ticked. Then he goes to Tan, um, Candace Owens. She's his African American. That's another box ticked. And that's all he's been surrounded, and that's all he's digesting constantly. So okay. he thinks he's right. I, I, and he gets I, confirmation. Here's a question then, and, and I'm going to yeah. set you up in relief to the second Stephen that rang in, who, who, who I thought very courageously and creditably described how he fell for it, and then how he saw the light. So you've you've clearly spent some time exploring the rabbit hole, why do you yeah. think you didn't fall down it? It was probably by my beliefs heading into it. Yeah. That's the reason. Like, for instance, I would be guilty of being, of falling down the, um, the Labour rabbit hole mm. in our last leader. Yeah. And it took a number of listening to you, actually, and reading yes. to realise that it while I thought he was a decent enough individual and maybe a lot of his, his policies sure. um, were true, it took me a while to, to realise that he was an absolute disaster for the Labour Party. And that, I fell into that. So I know it, it's not a, an exact comparison. Oh, no, no, it's not an exact comparison, it but it's a helpful a, one, isn't it? It is, and it gives you an idea of how that... But I think um, people falling down the rabbit hole wanted to fall down. Now, some... Or moderate racists, if that's yes. a possibility. Yes, it is a possibility. And, or yeah. even people who don't realise they're racist. They're just uncomfortable yes, exactly. with the pace of change. And I think that's a yes, real exactly. thing. The legitimate economic concerns and the left behind, that's all nonsense. But uncomfortable with the pace of change is a fair feeling to have. And if Trump was ever, ever confronted in any of his press conferences, and it was someone from CNN or somewhere else, the hand went up and the stat line was fake news. Mm, straight away. You know, it's very similar, James. If I scold one of my kids for something, something wrong. Yeah. And I say, I'm walking down the stairs and I say, oh God, there was a, did I go too strong there? The first thing I'll do is I go to my wife. And if she backs me up, I'm fine. But if, if she, she doesn't, yeah. I have to question myself. The, and he was never asked to do that. And you know, you said there when he was faced with black is black. He was never faced with that really. Because he was never questioned. I mean, the, the, the centre media, the proper media as they call it, tried to do it. But they never got their hands on them. Uh, no, and they didn't. And uh, that's uh, you, um, you've taken me right up to the break. We'll talk again, Piers. And uh, just uh, uh, Balinar, yeah. Uh, no, Balinar. 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 Where, Balinar. Where, where Jack Charlton used to go fishing. <laughs> there you go. And, uh, that puts it all into. Thank you for the call. Um, uh, and and yeah, he's the, I mean, again, I know I say it every day at the moment. The calls today. I, I know what you're thinking. I wish the presenter had just shut up and listened more. Now, not unlike Henry, the mild-mannered janitor in Hong Kong, Fui. 
Theo Oshawa doesn't always come across as a confrontational or indeed pugilistic person, but I don't know if you were listening to Pierce a moment ago in Ireland describing the failure of the American media to sort of stand up to Trump properly and, and more pertinently perhaps to Trumpism. And the man Steve Bannon, who um, has been pardoned by President Trump for defrauding President Trump supporters who sent money to Steve Bannon's organization to build a wall in Mexico that Donald Trump was elected on a promise the Mexicans would pay for. I love the symmetry of that. I mean, you know, you know me, contempt for the con men, compassion for the con, but it has a limit. What are you doing? I'm sending money to Steve Bannon. Why? Because we've got to pay for that wall. What did Trump say about it? The Mexicans were going to pay for it. So do you think you're going to get a refund or something in pesos? So Steve Bannon, a uniquely unpleasant individual, and um, he polluted this very studio when our um, presenting roster was rather different from, from what it is now. And Theo Usherwood was required to join in. From Theo, just quickly on Tommy Robinson, he said he wasn't, you said he wasn't Islamophobic. Every single w Muslim watching this, on 7-7, you got away with killing and maiming British citizens. No, 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 no. actually, I don't, no, no, to be fair, you said you disagreed with Tommy yeah. Robinson on yeah, Islam. Yeah. But, yeah. You, but, but before the break, no. before the break, you said he wasn't, before the break, you said he wasn't Islamophobic. Well, I don't, I, I said, I don't know if Islam he, is I, not a religion of peace. Islam he, is fascist and it's violent and we've had enough. They're I don't, I don't know, I don't head. know if I, you know, Islamic phobic about shipping guys out and stuff like that. I don't know if Tommy's like that. I mean, but he and I disagree about the religion of Islam, okay? But I don't think Tommy's a bad guy. I think he's a solid guy and I think he's got to be released from prison. But he broke the law. When you, 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 you break the law, you break. First of all, it's a highly technical. It was a highly technical. It was a highly. You talked about citizens at the southern border and adhering to the law. Tommy Robinson, by what he filmed outside that courtroom, he broke the law. Well, of course, according, 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 no, according, 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 according to the interpretation of that judge, a lot of people will say that that law is way too restrictive. What about? What, That's what, what, by the way, just free speech is just free speech. It's interpretation of what they said. We're going to move on. We got. By the way, are you a news guy? Are you? Are you? Are you? Are you? I suppose we're an even hand news guy. Are you? Are you? No. Are you? Are you a news guy? Are you? No. You just out on something. You're saying well, something more than that. You get, brother, brother, brother listen, you got to go. And, hold it. Stop. Theo, stop. You got to go Theo, a lot better. You got to go Theo, a lot. I take the view as well that Tommy Robinson broke the law. I've always taken that view. Good Lord. I, you know, even with that ding dong between Theo Usherwood and the despicable Steve Bannon, I still sort of feel slightly soiled by the voice of Farage. Um, this is what happened off air. Coming up, pupils as young as four as to have consent classes to counter soaring sexual assault. Well, if you're going to do news, dude, do news. I don't hear you. If you're going to do news, do news. Is this the you Before that, Lady Davis. Do news, do news. If you're going to 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 do news, do news. If you're Join me as I analyze the rise of right wing populism across the West. You come on, you come on and say, Tom, to Steve Bannon's views. Is it correct? You're just another guy that hates Tommy Robbins. We are that historic. Everybody hates Tommy Robbins. Yeah. Apart to, to, be, to be fair, the reason I have theory in is also we have so much stuff coming in as well. Oh, wait. It's 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 you hate Tommy Robinson. You hate him because he's a working class guy. You want these fing elites to hate him. Tommy Robinson. Tommy Robinson. From Global's newsroom, Donald Trump's former chief strategist, Steve Bannon. <laughs> Theo, mate, you are a don. Were you frightened that day? I mean, listen to your voice. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was tempted to say something like, if you want to come for Theo, then you have to come through me, but you don't need my protection or, or, or my support. You must be one of the only journalists on the planet that called him properly to account. People, of course, in some quarters of the media, still treating Farage like an honest broker, but there you were, not even criticising or condemning, simply questioning and holding to account. Happy times, uh, yeah. James. I came out of that studio, actually, and... <laughs> The funny thing was, he was—he had quite a few big, burly-looking blokes around him who had escorted him into the studio. I didn't quite know what he was—he was expecting, <laughs> and so I, I sort of walked down past as if I was going to go back to my desk, and they were sort of standing there. I sort of turned around, um, so it wasn't all, and I went back down through the fire exit. Um, I didn't quite fancy walking past them all, but what I was always surprised about. Um, and, and it sort of takes me back listening to that again, it was nearly th two and a half years old, was that he started the interview by saying uh, that he was a street fighter, 
he was Street Fighter Steve Bannon. He's a Street Fighter of politics and he'll is sock it, it to it, anybody. Is it true that he kept squirting himself with Lynx Africa? But, but actually what, what is true, and, and I kind of wish I'd said it at the time, and I didn't say it, and I was kicking myself afterwards, was that he almost burst into tears. I, I, and it's true to say his bottom lip was quivering. He was so angry yes. because he'd thought that I was a, a friend. Mm. I, I, he thought I was a mate and and that I was somehow going to give him an easy ride and let him sort of... He oh, felt, Fat Farage had rolled out the red carpet. Thankfully, you were there to keep things honest. He was... He was he felt betrayed that I'd questioned him. And he, he literally was about to... To cry, oh, and uh, and I didn't say it, I didn't say it. I almost felt like I should have said it in front of him because then it would have perhaps given people the impression that he wasn't the street fighter and the hard man that he was billing himself um, out to be. But there, there we, there we go. We will make a phone in presenter if you ever decide to step down <laughs> into the shallows of of, of of political journalism. We could make a phone in presenter of you yet. I don't know if I've ever given you one of these before, but I'm giving you one now. Right, that's enough for that. Back to the day Thank job. You. What are we expecting at PMQs? So there is going to be plenty, I would imagine, on schools. Um, and, of course, there was this uh, £78 million mass testing programme introduced only five weeks ago, which is now being put on pause. I'm sure Keir Starmer will be asking about that and asking the Prime Minister exactly when pupils are going to be able to fa return to the classroom for uh, some face-to-face -face, uh, teaching. There's going to be, uh, I expect, some questions about Pretty Patel's uh, off, uh, ha off, well, guarded, less, gu less than guarded comments that uh, she thought the borders should have been closed. I've got uh, that. Stay March. there. I've got that. It's quite hard to make out because she did it. I think on a on a on a. Well, you tell me where she did it. It was on a Zoom call to some uh, to a conservative uh, some some conservative supporters so she possibly wasn't expecting it to get picked no. up or to get noticed and and you it was the conservative friends of india i believe so you you need to yes. be very quiet uh, not just you everybody especially the kids in the back of the car be quiet your mum's trying to listen because oh, it should be a close up order so the answer is yes um i was mad because to close them last march whoa Okay, so the yes. Home Secretary wanted to close the borders last March, but but a different decision was overall, prevailed. A, a different decision prevailed, um, uh, and of course there'll be... Um, and, and Priti Patel, to be fair to Priti Patel, uh, James, has taken quite a lot of um, uh, heat in the House of Commons and beyond for the failure to close uh, the borders. Um, of course, it's her responsibility as the Home Secretary, and her, she has abided by collective responsibility of the Cabinet um, and has not made any comments publicly that she actually pressed the Prime Minister um, and other senior figures within the Cabinet to close the borders um, since uh, last March. But this has obviously come out and it will give Keir Starmer some ammunition at the dispatch box uh, in the next few moments. As I'm sure there will be some questions about the Pfizer vaccine reports now that the supply of that vaccine are incredibly constrained. Yes. Uh, and, uh, of course, there is that 12-week uh, cut-off for people to receive their second doses. Uh, and Keir Starmer, if he is trying to get ahead of the curve, uh, will be pointing out that uh, would people who receive the vaccine um, potentially at the beginning of uh, this month suddenly find themselves having to go back into... Uh, a situation where they're shielding or staying at home because the immunity that they get from that first dose um, has uh, will not be what it's needed to be um, should that 12-week deadline uh, expire and they have not received their second dose of the vaccine. There was one report that the... Because the numbers went down yesterday and I, possibly the day before, but that because they've prioritised care homes and it takes longer per vaccination um in a care home than it will in in the in the in the wider public that that might have explained the dip in in doses but you're right there are questions and one of them will be why trumpet the target from the rooftops why not just say we're going to do our best instead of saying you know like they've done before well it'll be over by christmas it'll be over by summer we'll do this it'll be world beating it's and then just falling apart so if this one does land great but you'd think they would have learned the futility stroke foolishness of saying well it will definitely happen by the you know the, it, the umpteenth of, of december or whatever it is the, the problem for boris johnson um if he doesn't meet this target isn't going to be keir starmer it's going to be his own backbenchers yeah, who are yeah. many of whom are absolutely desperate that he starts to lift the lockdown restrictions um, and, of course, this target ties into the fact that he'd been hoping, and he said originally when he imposed this third 
lockdown uh, that he would be hoping to uh, start to return to some sort of normality by Easter and that there'd be a gradual lifting of restrictions possibly as early as March uh, once they he can be sure that that first dose of the vaccine has kicked in with the 14 most uh, 14 million most vulnerable people across the country to have received uh, that vaccine so Boris Johnson won't be overly, overly concerned necessarily um, what Keir Starmer has to say on this subject, but he will be worried about what the likes of Steve Baker, what the likes of Mark Harper, what the likes of Sir Graham Brady, Charles Walker, uh, if they start making noises off that he really starts, he, that he needs to start as the Prime Minister, uh, releasing the restrictions and getting Britain back um, to, to, to man- normality. Indeed. Are we keeping a close eye on proceedings? As soon as Keir Starmer gets to his feet, we will cross over. We haven't even had an interim wipe down yet. Just referring back to your... Uh, you just, I mean, people who don't know Theo, he's, he's just a lovely man. And he's a professional and he's a brilliant journalist. And he doesn't subscribe to the idea that news should be entertainment. And just looking back at that, um, that listening back to that interview with... Call it an interview. Intervention, I think, would be closer. And 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 I, I, I mean, a few people suggesting you deserve a Ray Liotta, Theo. I don't know if we should get that carried away. But, and then and then <laughs> remembering what else Bannon did. How, how, you know, who rolled out the red carpet for him? Who treated him like an honest broker? Jacob Rees-Mogg met with him in a Mayfair hotel for for over an hour on the day, on the day that Theresa May was trying to criticise Trump for, for sharing Islamophobic material from a far-right fringe group in this country. And that was the day Rees Mogg decided, let's go and have afternoon tea with Steve Bannon. Strange times. I might take the news, Theo, because it looks like they're very late for PMQs, which is uncharacteristic of Lindsay Hoyle, but, but stay where you are and, 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 go and go and feel the love for you on social media at the moment as a, as a result of us playing out just one of your many, many greatest hits. I don't know how Simon Mark does it. How do you steer through? Are you looking forward to a more peaceful professional life, Simon Marks? Yes, with the caveat that I'm not entirely certain that that's going to arrive. No, I, mean, I for, know, I know. We discussed you know, so that yesterday. But it is, you're, you're not going to be cataloguing calumnies and corruption from the actual White House, are you? No, that, that will definitely be a, uh, that is definitely a new dawn that mm. is uh, about to arrive here. Um, President Trump leaving the White House, we think, in about 10 minutes time, uh, heading to his send-off ceremony at Andrews Air Force Base. <laughs> there is copious amounts of evidence to suggest that they have had difficulty recruiting a crowd to engage Surely in the not. send-off. Yeah, oh, because um, they should go. it's not too late for Nigel to hop on a plane, is it? Uh, well, you could probably just no, he probably is too late. Oh, um, them but uh, but no, they've had <laughs> trouble off. filling it. They've had trouble filling it because all of these people that he's crossed mm. over the last four years have all disclosed that they were being hastily invited to attend the send off ceremony, oh, I saw including, this. Yes. including Scaramucci, uh, the former the White thing, House chief of staff John Kelly, who said dreadful things about Donald Trump now that he's no longer the White House chief of staff. Never had many of them to say while he was the White House chief of staff. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see just how substantial the crowd or lack thereof is at Andrews Air Force Base, where apparently he's going to make a 15-minute speech on top of the 19-minute videotaped farewell uh, that he put out yesterday, insisting that his movement is only just getting started and the best is yet to come. He Mm. actually uses that phrase at the end of the video. And then he, with the nuclear football, because remember he'll still be carrying that, will clamber aboard Air Force One for one last insult to the country, the flight to Florida, uh, instead of the attendance at the inauguration. And I actually did the maths last night for Tom Swarbrick. Oh, yes. Donald Trump is, as we speak, 1,584 feet away from Joe Biden. They have spent the night separated by a mere 1,584 feet, the distance between the White House, where the Trumps were spending their final night, and Blair House, where the Bidens were spending their first night in Mm. Washington. It's directly opposite the White House. At any time, Donald Trump, or who knows, even the First Lady, who championed, of course, as you were noting, the Be Best campaign, (laughs) they could have said to the Secret Service, I tell you what, let's walk across the street and at least welcome them to Washington. Basic good manners. Just 
basic decency, even if you were then going to snub presidential tradition, America's constitutional traditions, and skip town and not bother to attend the inauguration, much less invite them into the White House for a cup of coffee and an opportunity to, to check out the furniture. None of that, of course, has happened. So, um, and I hadn't heard that line about her outsourcing the thank you notes. Yeah. That's, uh, that's tremendous. But also, you know, just evidence of the fact that you know, the legacy that they're talking about trying to celebrate today is just so very thin in so many areas. I mean, there are unquestionably accomplishments, uh, you know, the the, the, fl the flurry of uh, agreements that have been signed between Israel and various uh, countries that had age-old animus towards it. I mean, they weren't at war with it. They weren't really peace agreements, but they were nonetheless uh, achievements of a concrete fashion in foreign policy. We saw yesterday Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, uh, on the Trump administration's final day, branding China uh, a country that is engaged in genocide against the Uyghur Muslims in uh, Xinjiang. That is going to be an issue that Joe Biden inherits. Yes. Um, and look, we can all agree that the economy was in relatively strong shape, certainly not the strongest economy in the history of the world, as the president likes to describe it, but it was in strong shape before COVID-19 hit. But no, it was then, in of course, yeah, I know where you're going next. But, it was in then, strong course, shape before it became president. <laughs> Well, it was in strong shape before he became president as well. But then, of course, the denialism about COVID-19. And, and, you know, one has to keep remembering there is nothing inherently Republican about denying the threat a global pandemic poses no. to your country. That and the four hundred thousand number, the four hundred thousand deaths that we notched up yesterday, the threshold was passed yesterday. Uh, you know, really is a, a monumental difficulty for Donald Trump, coupled with then the violent insurrection on Capitol Hill two weeks ago. Do you? I can't forgive me if I've asked you this before. I, I, I mean, it, it, things get muddled up in the madness. But if if the virus hadn't come along, do you think he'd? be celebrating the start of his second term today. Well, I think it's very possible. Yeah. Uh, and I think, actually, even if the virus had con come along and he'd reacted to it in a responsible, normal vaguely, fashion... Vaguely, vaguely responsible if way. He, I mean, there's no reason why he couldn't have led a massive patriotic effort to rally the country and to say, we're in a war, we're going mm. to do exactly what we did during the Second World War, we are going to come together... I am going to engage in national leadership here. I'm not going to play individual states off against one another. But in order to do that, he would have had to have been a different human being. He would have had to have been a man who was willing to spend time understanding the details uh, of viruses, of vaccines, of the uh, public health professional's response to all of this. And, you know, I, I'm always interested watching from afar, much as uh, I understand the criticism that exists uh, uh, on your side of the Atlantic about mm. the way the government has responded to COVID-19. It is still jarring for those of us who are here to watch those briefings that Boris Johnson and other government ministers have held, flanked as they are by Chris Whitty and Patrick Vallance, and to see the floor being given to science advisors who in this country have been not just marginalized, but absolutely deliberately undercut by the President of the United States at every turn, pulling the rug out from beneath Dr. Deborah Burks, yes. Dr. Anthony Fauci, until he found a doctor he liked, Dr. Scott Atlas, who basically believes in herd immunity and just let the virus rip. And, and the, it's just been jarring to observe that from a 4,000 mile distance. I'm sure it has. And you lead us perfectly back to where the program began this morning with the question of, of whether Donald Trump actually believes the lies that come out of his mouth. And of course, finding a doctor who would support what he wanted to be true as opposed to what was actually true is is a perfect example of that. You, you, I'm sure you'll be on with Sheila, but you're, you're limbering up for, for, the, for the big event with Eddie Mayer later, <laughs> later this afternoon. Simon, thank you. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to, to talk to you at any time, but the, your, the, the quality of your coverage and the caliber of your journalism throughout Donald Trump's tenure in the White House has been a privilege to witness, never mind um, uh, to, to actually be part of. So thank well, you very thank much, Simon. Thank Mark. you very much. It's been a privilege to do it, and we shall continue doing it, even with a new course, president. Of course we will. There may be some court cases on the horizon that you'll have to cover for us as well. One can only hope.